Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn please to Psalm 3. Well, I nearly lost it there in the praise. It's almost like this is like an anticlimax having to listen to me. You know, the presence of God is here. And that's really what we need. So the word of God has to come in the light of the presence of God. You know, we, I can have prepare a sermon and expound it to do whatever, but if it's not in the context of the Spirit of God moving in our midst, it's just another lecture on how to be a better person. But the idea of preaching is to receive something from heaven that will make a difference to your life. So the Word of God becomes quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides us under soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and discerns the, the thoughts and the intents of our heart. So we, we have to come to a place of understanding that it's not just, was that a good sermon, or wasn't it? You know, who's a better preacher, this person or that person? It's understanding that God has something to say. If God has nothing, nothing to say, let's go home. We're wasting our time. Because we're living in perilous times. You don't meet, need me to tell you that. The last, since about October for me, has been awful because I've had to deal with my, my mother-in-law's passing away and a whole lot of stuff. And then this stuff that happened in Israel completely threw me, it affected my health and everything else. And I had to, had to wrestle with all that until I came to a place of rest in God until I came to a place I understood that God is actually in control. He doesn't need me to tell him what to do. He doesn't need my opinion. Quite humbling, really, isn't it? Okay, Psalm 3. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. But thou, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down and slept. Hallelujah. And I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Okay, you know, when we come, especially in, in the authorized version, when you see the word Lord in the Old Testament, written in capital letters, they wrote that because they didn't want to it's actually the word Jehovah or Yahweh. So when I, cause when I read at home, I read out loud. Whenever I see, because it's a covenant name. So David is speaking this in the light of knowing he has a covenant with God. So he's using the covenant name. So when, when the Lord appeared to Moses in the desert, he says, he revealed himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then he gave them the covenant name of Jehovah, or Yahweh. Well, I use the word Yahweh because I'm more comfortable with it. But I don't know how it's really pronounced, so it doesn't matter. Yahweh, how they increase that trouble me. Many are they that rise up against me. Many they be which say of my soul, there is no help of him in God. But thou, O Yahweh, are a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto Yahweh with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down and slept, I awaked, for Yahweh sustained me. I would not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Yahweh, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto Yahweh. Their blessing is upon thy people. Hallelujah. The context of these, the psalmist says, the son of David when he fled from Absalom. Now that's like, 
you know, we can read the Psalms and when we see what David is really going through, Absalom, as you know, was his son who decided to rebel against him and take the kingdom from him. And so David was on the run. Absalom managed to seduce all of Israel to come onto his side. He managed to convince Ahithophel, who was, the, who was David's counselor, to get on his side. And basically everyone had turned against him, except the 600 faithful men that he had and his family. And so he's on the run. Absalom is going to kill him. And I don't know, because I don't have kids, what it's like knowing your son wants to kill you. For no good reason. I mean, Absalom is one of my least favorite people. He killed his brother Amnon because he raped his sister. And when he was on the run, David brought him back, received him like a son again. And he used, used that to turn the people against David. Now, how does it. He was totally indebted to David. And he turned against him. And Ahithophel gave him counsel to say, you know, you've got to make sure all Israel's on your side. You have to know that you're right against David. And he got Absalom to sleep with the ten concubines of David in the sight of all Israel. Now, this was a judgment from God that came on David because of his sin with Bathsheba. You know, the curse does not cause us come. David knew, as he's saying to Psalm, that he was worthy of God's judgment. But Psalm 51 is that glorious psalm where he says, cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be cleansed. You know, the issue about sin is that we're always mindful of it. I mean, I can never forget the wrong that I've done. It's always there before me. But God does not keep an account of it. Well, church will keep an account of it. People remind me. You know, when we think about ministries that have fallen, right, and we mention a certain name, we never think, oh, yeah, I remember that guy. You know, he used to go to Africa and this, all these people got saved. Oh, yeah, that's the guy that ran away with that person's wife. Remember? We tend to remember people's sin. And the devil is always mindful to remind us because it's so much easier to remember. And so David is in the situation now. He's on the run from Absalom and he's, he's there. But he's come to the place in God where he realizes that he has passed from judgment into life. God said I've, in Psalm 51, I've put you, not in Psalm 51, in in 2 Samuel 11, I think, or 12. I've put your sin away. God has removed it. As far as east is from west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all your sins, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. These things, God says what he means and he means what he says. The reason we don't give ourselves to it is because it seems too good to be true. If he saved us from hell, we think, well, that's enough. Well, he didn't save us because he felt sorry. He saved us for himself because he wants to show his glory. He wants, he's invested glory in every one of us. He invested glory in David. And David knew that. David knew that on his own he couldn't stand. But he knew that God had spared him. And he knew that in spite of everything that had happened, that God was for him. He said, Thou, O Lord, are a shield for me the glory and the lifter up of my head. Because when we are mindful of our sin, our head tends to hang down. And then we come to church and I hope they don't know what I've done. But God lifts us up. He says, look up, for your redemption draws nigh. God is always causing us to look up. God has put away our sin as far as east 
is from west. The devil's job is to remind us of our sin. Our job is to resist the devil. But we collude with him because it's so much easier. The devil works in the realm of your senses. He works in the realm of your understanding. God works in the realm of faith. And he reveals his work there. And so our faith has to be in the word rather than how we feel or our circumstances. David could be sitting there and say, well, I did mess up pretty bad. Yeah, and I do deserve to lose a kingdom. And Absalom is right, you know. After all, I did shame the family a bit by sinning with that Sheba. He could have all the reasons to doubt God. He'd messed up big time. But God said, I put away your sin. But there was, the consequence of sin was still there. And this is the thing that sometimes we come to church, we have this easy forgiveness. But sin always has a consequence. Yeah. You know, be not deceived, God is not mocked for what a man sows that shall he also reap. But God does not take an account of it. Okay? Because he's put away our sin. So our relationship with God, because we're justified, is constant. Your children are your children, whatever they do. The benefits that they receive could be affected by how they behave. Yeah. <laughs> so God is always for you. And he's always finding a way to get you out of your mess. He's always finding a way to get me out of my mess. Sometimes I'm happier in my mess because I feel comfort comfortable in it. You know, like a, like, like, like a pig in mud, you know, it's much easier, much more comfortable than to be clean. But God's calling us out. And here David, he's so convinced of God, he says, Thou, O Lord, are a shield about me, the glory and the lifter up of my head. I cried unto my voice, Lord, my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. And this is the bit, I lay me down and slept. When you're surrounded by enemies, you don't sleep. I remember years ago when I, lived in, when I lived in London, there was a guy who was always threatening to come round and smash the place up and do stuff like that. It wasn't an idle threat. Sometimes he'd do it. It's just one of those things. And he used to do it. He used to ring up and, I'm stupid, you know. I used to leave the phone on. My phone, my phone goes up at 11 o'clock now. You know, if they need, anyone needs me, they can talk to God. He's actually more important than I am. And so, but he used to go, and I, used to, I remember thinking, oh, no, if you come, blah, blah, this is going to happen. I need to ring the police. What do I do? And all this trauma. He doesn't come. <laughs> but he might come. I lay me down and slept. I learned something years ago uh, around the time I was going through probably the worst time in my life. And it was, you know, when you're anxious and you can't sleep, you know, just you can pray it off, you can do whatever, but you've got, you got to get sleep because you've got to go to work next day. You know, your responsibilities don't stop because, you, because you've got trouble. And the Lord gave me this scripture. I will not, I will not, how does it go? I will not give rest to my eyes nor slumber to mine eyelids until I found a resting place for the ark of God. This was David. He was keen to find a resting place for the ark of God. He wanted, um, that's why he wanted to build a temple. He wanted God to be there. And what happens with us when our heart is troubled, there isn't a resting place for the ark of God. So I learned to get on my knees and travail until I found that rest. And then I go to sleep. I've been doing that for over 20 years. It works. Don't go to bed until you find a resting place for the ark of God. You could have noisy neighbors, you could have whatever they are. Don't let them control you. Get before God, find the resting place, and you will sleep. Because the Lord sustains you. He sustains every part of us. He is our keeper. Yeah? I can't keep myself. But it says, I will not be afraid of 10,000 of people that have set themselves against me round about. This has happened. 
you know, I think he had an army of about 600 and against the, against the rest of Israel. And Ahithophel had counseled that they all go together, surround him, and crush him. But thankfully, Hushai came up then and changed the whole thing. And Absalom took the wrong counsel and basically, in the end, they lost that battle. But here is David confident in the midst of it all. And the great thing about it is that he didn't want anyone to harm Absalom. He gave them orders that don't hurt Absalom. Well, they killed him because I think they did the right thing. Yeah. But David then cried for him. He mourned for him because he still loved him. How can you love someone like that? But this is what the love of God shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost does. Love your enemies, bless them to curse you. Do good to them to hate you. Pray for them, despitefully use you and persecute you. As he hung on that cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's very easy to vindicate ourselves. It's very easy to, to be right about things. I was talking to someone the other day and had a real problem with the with the pastor in the church and, and I think he was right and confronted it and the whole thing anyway I was concerned I think he did the right thing but I was concerned about how it affects him you know I can I can fall out with the elders in the church here but that will affect me I could be right about what I fall out about but God doesn't bless you because you're right he blesses you because you humble yourself and today, today I got a message from saying he went and humbled himself to the guy, and I thought, thank God for that. God will bless him. You know, God, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, in the mighty hand of God. And here David had completely humbled himself in the sight of God. He knew that he wasn't worth God's blessing. But God had a covenant, and God was going to bless him whether he liked it or not. God was going to protect him because of his covenant. And we've come into something far greater than David had. It's called the blood of the everlasting covenant, something that God promised before the foundation of the world. The Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world before he said, light be. He had a plan. And he chose us in him. Okay? I, I think if I was given the choice today, I don't think I would choose God. It's because everything in me is about myself. I'm so thankful that God chose me. And people say, yeah, but you know, what about your response? It was grace. If I can take any credit for my salvation, I don't have it. <laughs> you know, when I... When I get to glory, he's not going to give me a crown for saying, for making the right decision. Because he gets all the glory. We'll be casting our crowns before him. Because he did something that we were never worthy of. And David, you know, he was known as, he was known as, as a sweet psalmist of Israel. He was known as a man after God's own heart. But when he fell, that's what people remembered. And so when he was going up to the sail, and there, was, there was a guy that was cursing him, serve your right, you know. He called, him, he called him all sorts of names, and Abishai said, you know, let me kill it, let me take off his head. He said, no, leave him alone. Maybe God has told him to curse. David knew that he could never vindicate himself anymore. And we are big into the spirit of self-vindication. We always want to vindicate ourselves. We always want to show that we're right. It wasn't my fault. Well, you can either vindicate yourself or let God vindicate you. If you let God vindicate you, it'll always be a blessing. Self-vindication will always bring trouble. And here, it says, Arise, O God, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone, thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Our enemy has been defeated. Yeah? He has no power except that we give him any. All power, I don't know when Paul was doing the, 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 
God's character. God has all power. Okay? That means you don't have any. That means I don't have any. That means the devil doesn't have any. All power belongs to God. And he lends it as he wills. He could remove his power from me just now and I could drop dead. I'm sustained by the power of God. You're sustained by the power of God. And the devil can only do what God allows him to do. And can only do in my life what I allow him to do. Yeah? Therefore, he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. How do you resist the devil? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's always about drawing near to God. It's always about humbling yourself and coming into his presence and receiving something that you cannot receive by striving or by positive confession or by anything that you try to do to show how, how you can deliver yourself. I was coming back from my sister's on, on Wednesday and I had the whole thing planned out. I left a place about 1.40. I planned to get to where I was getting to by 5.00 and I got stuck on the motorway, there was an accident. I was at a standstill for four and a half hours. Uh, you know. And I sat there, and I remember years ago, I started praying in tongues and claiming this and praying that. And I was perfectly at peace. I knew that God was with me. I wasn't even rejoicing and giving thanks. I was just, I'd never experienced what that is like. David said, I laid me down and slept. I knew there was nothing to fret about. Because you know, we try to work out our own salvation, don't we? We try to work out our own way. What should I do? Who should I ring? What shall I do? I got home at half past 11 that night. It was a three-hour journey. But all through it, God sustained me. But I've, I've sort of learned that in the last year, in the sense I've stopped working full-time and stuff like that, because I had more time to spend in devotion, and more time to get to, know, to get to know the Lord, to understand that everything's in c control. He hasn't missed anything, even when I mess up. Yeah. This guy messes up all the time. He keeps saying hallelujah. I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, even when we mess up, he's in control. He doesn't let go, you know. Your child messes up, you don't say, well, you can leave now. <laughs> he doesn't. He said, I will never leave you. He said, I'll never, 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 never leave you or forsake you. So we can boldly say, the Lord is my keeper. What can man do unto me? We don't have to justify ourselves. We don't have to vindicate ourselves. God is our keeper. And here is David in the worst circumstances you could think of. He was completely guilty of that sin. Whenever I hear somebody preach on David and Bathsheba, I always hear how David, at the time the kings go to war, David stayed behind. And... David should have, you know, David neglected his duty and he should have gone, he should have gone to war and he, um, and this, therefore this happened. And I've heard people tell kids in Sunday school, you know, you should keep yourself busy. Look what happened to David. And I thought, you know where I'm coming from. It's all grace. God had promised David David wanted to find a resting place for the ark of God. He wanted to build that tabern he wanted to build that uh, build a tabernacle, remember? He wanted to build a house of God. And God said to him, you've got blood on your hands because of all the wars around you. Know, things are not settled. He says, there'll be a son that will come from your loins and he will build a house. Now, I think David is getting older. The sons of God are useless. It's not going to be them because they already come from his loins. He's saying, where's the son that's going to come? And he probably stayed behind because he was praying. He's probably seeking the Lord, like, what's going to happen about this? Perfectly personal. You can reject it if you like. But when you get intensity of prayer, the devil is always present. When Jesus was at Gethsemane, And he said, he said to the Father, let this hour pass from me. And again, people interpret that to say, he didn't really want to go to the cross. Well, that's ridiculous, because that's the very purpose he came for. 
he knew that he had to go through that hour of prayer to get equipped. And he knew the kind of temptation he would have in that time of prayer. And he said, if it be possible, let us let this hour pass from, let this cup from. He wanted, he wanted to get through without having to go through that. And he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. The intensity of spiritual prayer there, none of us really understand. None of us really understand Gethsemane. None of us have ever been to that level of prayer, maybe apart from Cyril, but not even Cyril. Okay. But it's, it's intense. And Jesus went through that so that he was equipped as the Son of Man to go to the cross. As the Son of God, he could have walked it. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He was tempted in every point, like as we were, yet without sin. And he managed to resist in Gethsemane. David didn't resist. He fell. And we have another thing about Bathsheba. But then God judged him because he, he managed to kill Bathsheba's husband take her to wife, and he, was, and he had the son. So God said, that son is going to die. But then he produced Solomon. Solomon was the son who was going to build a temple. And God called his name Jedidah, which would be just the beloved of the Lord. So God set his love upon Solomon. You see, when God cleanses you from your sin, as far as the east is from west, so far has he removed our transgressions. He didn't say, today, I'll give you another son, but you, know, you didn't mess up. No, it's gone. And Solomon was the son that God had planned to build that temple. In the midst of our mess, I mean, there's none of us without sin. There's none of us that hasn't messed up in one way or another. There's none of us that hasn't regretted something we've said or something we've done. And yet God has taken all this into account before he chose you. He knows the end from the beginning. When we were dead in our trespasses and our sins, he could have just let us go. He didn't need us. But God has set his love upon us. He has set his love upon Israel. He has set his love upon David. When God sets his love upon you, there is no logic in do. You know that hymn that says, O oh, love that will not let me go. God is committed to you. Here in his love, not that we love God, but he loved us and he gave his son for us. So here is David understanding something very few Christians understand. He was in the midst and he said, God is a shield about me. Salvation belongs to God. Thy blessing is upon thy people. God is blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. That means there's nothing that the devil can do to touch our salvation. We are sealed with the Spirit of God. Now we can give place to the devil, we can mess around, we can have a lousy life down here, but that's our choice. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings as the eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. In the last, in the last year, I've been obviously spending more time drawing on God and these things. And I've seen things happen, things I used to fret about, things that, I don't know, where I have to, where I have to be my own salvation and vindicate myself. They've all gone. And, you know, God is no respecter of persons. What he did for David... He can do for you. God is good. Amen. Amen. God bless you.